My name is Renee Clark, and this lecture is over Chapter 11 of the ThinkPython eBook. Dictionaries in Python 3. A dictionary is like a list, but it's more general. In a list, the indices have to be integers. In a dictionary, they can be almost any type. So your dictionary contains a collection of indices, which are called keys, and a collection of values. Each key is associated with a single value. The association of a key and a value is called a key value pair. Dictionaries represent a mapping from keys to values so that you can also say that each key maps to a value. The function DICT creates a new dictionary with no items. So remember, DICT is a built-in function and therefore you should not use it as a variable name. Here we're going to create a dictionary called EN2SP, so standing for English to Spanish. When we create it, we use the DICT open parentheses, close parentheses, that built-in function, and it creates an empty dictionary. The squiggly brackets that print out are representing that empty dictionary. To add items to the dictionary, we use square brackets. So here we have EN2SP open square bracket 1. I put the 1 inside of single quote marks, close square brackets equals single quote mark uno, 1 in Spanish, followed by a closing single quote mark. When I run that, that creates a map that's going from one, the key, to uno, the value. And if we print the dictionary, we'll see that key value pair. So here's our dictionary currently containing one key value pair with one as the key, uno as the value. The output format is also the input format. For example, we could create three items in the dictionary at once by using the squiggly brackets and a series of key value pairs with a colon in between each key and its value and a comma between each pair. When I run that code, you see that I now have not only one and uno, but I also have two, dos, three, tres. The order of the key value pairs might not be the same, so if you were to print the same dictionary multiple times on your computer, they might show up in a different order. It's not a problem because the values are indexed to keys, and it's not an integer indice, so it's not related to where they sit within the dictionary. We can also see that the key 2 is always going to be mapped to dose here. Doesn't matter when we call on it, it always goes to the same thing. However, if the key isn't in the dictionary, so example here 4, you're going to get an exception. In this case, we get a key error indicating that that key does not exist in this dictionary. The length function also works with dictionaries. It's going to return the number of key value pairs. So currently we should have three key value pairs, and we do. The in operator also works in dictionaries. It tells you whether something appears as a key. So it won't work with the values, but it does work with keys. So when I use it to say is one in my dictionary, it returns true. If I try it on a value, it returns false. To see if a value is in the dictionary, we have to use the methods value. So it's going to return a collection of values, then we can use the in operator. So I say uno in, and then with the en to sp, I put dot notation dot values. That then tells me that it's true, that it is in there. If I just use the dot notation for dot values, I get to see all of the values that are currently in my dictionary. Now, dictionary can also be used as a collection of counters. 
So if you have a string and you want to count how many times each letter appears, you can use your dictionary to do that. The advantage of a dictionary implementation is that we don't have to know ahead of time which letters will appear in the string. We only have to make room for the letters that end up appearing in the string. So here we're creating a function. So we're defining alpha count and we're using s to represent a string that's passed to the function. d is a dictionary that's created by the function to hold the characters found. c is a character found in, str in the string s. c also becomes the key for the key value pair, where the value is the number of times that the character c is in the string. And we set up the d dictionary as an empty dictionary. So let's create that and then let's try running it. So remember, each time through the loop, if the character C is not in the dictionary, we create a new item with the key C and the initial value of 1. And if C is already in there, we just increment the dictionary value of C. So here we've got H equal to alpha count and the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So we are calling our function alpha count, assigning it to H. And when we run H and print it out, you can see we have quite a few letters. The T is in there twice, H is in there twice, E four times. The blank is in there eight times, and so on. So you can really see what's going on, how many times a character shows up in this string. Dictionaries also have a method called get that will take a key and a default value. If the key appears in the dictionary, get returns the corresponding value. Otherwise, it returns the default. Here I've got h and I'm going to use my alpha count function to tell me how many times in the string a I have a count. So it returns that I've got a and I've only got a count of one, the value of one to key. So my key value pair is a showing up one time. In this example, I was using the alpha count function to figure that out, several lines of code. Instead, here I'm going to say h.get a, so I'm looking for a's, and tell me how many times it shows up. If it doesn't show up, return zero. And it says it is there once. Now, h.getb returns a zero. Because if you look up here, you can see in here we have a one, but we don't have any b's. So it's a much more efficient way to get to that value. You need to try to rewrite that and eliminate the if statement if possible. So you want to make it more concise and eliminate the if statement. So we're going to start with the same thing, define alpha count, passing it s, and then we're setting up our dictionary as an empty dictionary. And then instead of doing the if statement inside of our for, we're just going to do our for loop as we did before for c in s. And here we want to use the get statement. And if you do it right, you can get this down from four lines of code, one line of code. We will set our dictionary for C, our current character, equal to D dot get. Here we're using that get function and we're going to pass it C comma and we want it to return a zero if it doesn't find C, then we're going to increment by one. We're still going to return D. So here's our new function. Let's see what happens if we call alpha count on caret using our new, more concise version. You'll see we still get a count in our dictionary of each of these letters that is in the string we passed it. We could go back and rerun the, you know, our other string with about the fox, and we could see that it's still working for that as well. Next, let's look at looping and dictionaries. If you use a dictionary in a for statement, it's going to reverse the keys of the dictionary. So for example, print count will print each key and its corresponding value. So let's create that function. So we're saying define print count being passed the dictionary H for each K in H print out K 
and the value associated with k. Creating that function, now let's use our previous alpha count on parrot. So we've set up our dictionary of h to have these pairs in it. And now let's print it out using our print count function. And all it's doing is it's giving us a different way of printing them out. So it doesn't include all of the syntax. It just includes the letter and the value that's associated with that key item, which is the letter. Maybe you want to have something, your list sorted. Most of us want them sorted alphabetically. And there is a built-in function function called sorted. For key in sorted, and you pass sorted the dictionary here, h, and then we're going to also call that print function and pass it key and h, and we get, instead of in the order they appeared, we're getting them now here in alphabetic order. Now you can do this next exercise, which is to add in the sorted function to have the print count print in a sorted dictionary. If we were to do that, we would simply take, and in our print count, we would say instead of for C in H, we would say for C in sorted H, then print it out. And let's go ahead and show those. But instead of passing the same string, we're going to pass it pair it with two p's, a capital P and a lowercase p, to which we have applied the lower. So it will acknowledge and look at all of the letters in the string as if they were lowercase. Now we go from having A1, O1, P1 to having A1, O1, and P2. So we changed our string up. We used the dot lower method on our string in order to make it count all of the letters, whether they were uppercase or lowercase. If we take this out, let's see what happens. You'll see that now we have a capital P and a lowercase p. The last thing from this chapter that I'd like to look at today is reverse lookup. So given a dictionary called D and a key called K, it's easy to find the corresponding value by using v equal to d with an index of k. This operation we call a lookup. And what if you have v, but you don't know k? What do you do? Because in the past, we've always known what our k is. So if you don't know where it is in your dictionary, you don't know what its key is, you can instead do a reverse lookup. Two problems. There might be more than one key that maps to a value, and there is no simple syntax to do a reverse lookup. You have to search. So here's a function that's going to take a value and return the first key that maps to that value. So we're going to define our function, and here we've set it up so that if we don't find it, it's going to let us know with an error message that that value does not appear in our dictionary. So there's our dictionary. So let's now call reverse lookup. We know that uh, we want to find the twos. So let's look up what is the first letter appearing two times. In this case, it's the R. What if we want to find the ones that are the ones? If we run this against, it's first going to tell us the capital P, and it's going to stop. Keep in mind, a reverse lookup is much slower than a forward lookup. And if you have to do it often, or if the dictionary gets big, your program performance will suffer. If you have any additional questions, please consult your professor.